We're going to use what we learned in the last chapter about waves in general and apply this to sound waves in particular. Um, so let's start by talking about what sound waves are. Um, there's a couple different ways that you can model sound waves. What's going on microscopically is that the number of atoms, um, it, when you have a sound wave, uh, the number of atoms bunches up together and then stretch in some regions and stretches out as the sound wave goes through the um, it goes through the medium. So this is like when we had the slinky. In the slinky, you have the the mo wave moving transverse. A sound wave is a transverse wave because the uh, the oscillations are in the or sorry is a longitudinal wave uh, because the oscillations are in the direction of motion. It is along the direction of motion. So uh, the other way that you can picture this is that it is a pressure wave, so that as you talk or as some sound is sent through the air, the, it creates a, a pressure and that, uh, that the pre front of the pressure wave moves back and forth. And so this will lead to regions of greater pressure and regions of lower pressure as, this, as the wave travels through the medium. Now, these are different ways of describing the same phenomenon. The pressure wave is what actually bunches the, the atoms and molecules in the air up together. Now, um, we often talk about sound traveling in air. Sound can also travel in other media like, uh, like water, and it can travel through, uh, through solids as well. Regardless, it is a pressure wave um, that leads to uh, motion of molecules and atoms at the microscopic level uh, in, in, the, um, in whatever medium it's traveling through. Um, an example is if you have a pitch for a tuning fork. Um, so if you hit a tuning fork, it starts vibrating. It is shaped in a special way so that it has a resonance. Um, and when you smack it, it starts um, vibrating at that resonance. Um, and so you have, when you have a tuning fork that has been smacked, it emanates a sound wave at a certain frequency um, where the frequency is determined by the, the resonance of the solid. And whatever, the freq whatever frequency the, the tuning fork is oscillating at, that is the frequency of the sound wave. Um, and then once the sound wave starts traveling in air, it moves with the, um, with the speed of sound through the air. Um, and the frequency is fixed, and that will determine the, the wavelength. Bats use this to find, um, use sound waves in order to find prey. They, uh, they make noises, they, so they emanate some sound. Uh, it is where a high enough pitch that we cannot hear it. Um, and that sound wave goes and hits something like a bug, and it bounces off and uh, it is the bat can sense the reflection, um, the echo of, of the it ref, the echo is the reflection of the wave off of whatever obstacles are in the path of the sound wave, and it can use that in order to determine where the where the bugs are to go eat them, um, and it measures the time for the echo to um, to return to get the distance, and it also can tell from the um, the way that the reflection adds up with its incident wave, it can tell what the direction of the obstacle is. Um, so when you have a sound wave moving, moving through a fluid, and remember the air is an example of a fluid, um, the density, pressure, and velocity of the fluid change from one side to the other as the pressure wave moves through. So that you, you could, in principle, calculate the pressure calculate the force on each different side of the, the cube you're drawing. Um, and that is what is actually pushing the molecules and atoms in the air um, in order to create these bunches. So because they travel at the same speed in air, um, then so you have a fixed speed. And from last chapter, we remember that the wavelength times the, the speed is the wavelength times the frequency. They travel at the same speed. So if you have a low frequency sound, um, it has a higher wavelength than if you have a high frequency sound. The sounds that you hear is high pitch. Those are, uh, those are high frequency sounds. The sounds that you hear is low pitch. Those are um, low frequency sounds. And low pitches have long wavelengths. And high pitches have short wavelengths. Um, and here you can you can see generally when you're talking about devices that create sounds, 
uh, you generally want things, well, in general, when you're talking waves, to create or detect waves of a certain size, you want the object to be around the size of a wavelength. So when you are generating waves, in a, when you're using a speaker to generate waves, to make these, uh, to make low pitches, to make the bass part of the sound, you have a much larger section of the speaker, the woofer or subwoofer, and then to have, uh, to have high pitch sounds, you have a much smaller part of the, the speaker uh, called a tweeter. And then we can talk about the intensity of waves. So you've probably heard the phrase uh, decibel. A decibel is how we measure the intensity of the wave. The, a decibel in, so the intensity is the amount of energy per unit squared, or sorry, per area, unit area squared. Um, so we, uh, and then we measure the, de the decibels as this funny equation. It's 10 times the log base 10 of the intensity over the reference intensity I naught. The reference intensity is 10 to the negative 12 watts per meter squared. That means that every time you go up by, uh, by 10 decibels, you have a, the amount of the intensity, the amount of energy in the sound has gone up by an order of magnitude. So if you have a sound at one decibel and you go to 10 decibels, the intensity has gone up by a factor of, uh, the intensity has gone up by a factor of 10. And if you have, uh, if you have three decibels and, sorry, if, if you have, so this log base uh, 10, let me look at that equation and show you guys what it does. So I can write, uh, I can use my math for the for logs and S exponents and write I over I naught. So intensity is equal to I naught times 10 to the power of beta. So, okay, if, and I have to issue a slight correction. So if I have a sound that is one decibel, uh, I have done a slight math mistake. I needed to divide my beta by 10. Okay, so if I have a sound which is one decibel, that means I have an intensity which is equal to 0.1 times this reference intensity. Because it is 10 to the, ah, yeah, 10 to the point 0.1. Actually, 10 to the point 0.1 is 1.2 to six times I naught. Now, I have beta equals 10, and my intensity is, now I have 10 divided by 10, and I have, so I've increased the number of decibels by an order of magnitude, and this is 10 times I naught. Beta equals 20. And I have I equals 20 divided by 10. So I have 10 squared I naught. So if I go up by 10 decibels, my sound goes up by, my intensity goes up by an order of magnitude. So the intensity does not scale with the number of decibels. It, uh, it's a logarithmic scale. So 10 decibels is an order of magnitude. That's a lot. And that means that when you are considering how, um, how much damage something does to your ear, you have to remember that decibels are a logarithmic scale. So a change in a 
change of 10 is huge. Now, that's not always how we perceive uh, how we perceive sound. You measure how loud we perceive the sound in our ear by something called a phon. And here you can see the sound level measured, so the intensity, the amount of energy per unit area, measured in, uh, in decibels as a function of uh, the frequency. And so let's pick a line here. Um, so for about 100 hertz, you measure most things, so sounds that are at about 100 hertz, you measure most sounds, uh, most, uh, most frequency, sorry, sounds that are 100 decibels, you measure most frequencies to be about equally loud until you get to the very high-pitched sounds, and then you perceive them to be much louder. Um, and, but if you're down here at, the, uh, at lower decibel levels, there's a very strong dependence uh, of the, how you perceive the sound. Um, as a function of the frequency, so that you will actually perceive lower for the same intense, for the same amount of energy, you will actually perceive the sound to be much quieter than uh, for low pitched sounds than for high pitched sounds. And as you get to the very uh, end of the high pitches, then, uh, then what starts to happen is that you perceive the high pitches to be much louder for the same amount of intensity. And we talked about interference when we were talking about mechanical waves. We also have interference when we have sound waves. So if you have two, uh, if you have two speakers which both, produce, uh, with, which both produce sound, you can actually end up with, uh, with interference the same way that we did in, uh, in one dimension when we were talking about mechanical waves. Now, when you're talking about sound waves, they have a source, and um, on the time scale, of, of, so on the scales that we actually perceive, on the time and space scales, so the time, and the, the things that we perceive, um, we are actually aware that waves are spherical. Now, it turns out that most wave sources are actually approximately spherical, but uh, for a sound wave in particular because the waves tend to be, the, the wavelengths tend to be on the order of centimeters to um, the lower one, the lower pitched sounds might have a foot long uh, wavelength. That is on the, our, our physical scale. Um, maybe you might have meter long wavelengths. So these are scales that we can actually perceive. Now, when you have a spherical source, um, one common feature of any wave that is emanating from a point source is that it ends up being, it, it, it ends up roughly ending up distributed isotropically. So you can draw successively, uh, you can draw circles around the, uh, spheres around the source, and there's some energy given off at the source, and the surface area of a sphere is given by, uh, 4 pi r squared, where r is the radius of the sphere. So as you move out from the source, uh, you have the same amount of energy that you had at the source, but, uh, but the amount of energy per unit area is divided by a larger area. So the, en the intensity always falls off like 1 over r squared, because you have the same amount of energy divided by um, a larger and larger area as, your, as the radius of your sphere gets larger. Um, so the further away you get from a sound, the, the intensity of that sound falls off with the distance squared. That's why it's harder to get, to, that's one of the reasons it's harder to hear the sound as you move further away. Um, now we have these spherical wave fronts from any type of source. If we're talking about from about the waves from a, um, from a speaker in a room. Now the speaker tries to do some, tries to generate waves that are a little bit um, more like what we call plane waves, where it's, a, it's um, the same sound as you move further and further out from the, um, from the speaker. You can do this if your sphere is larger and larger, um, because a large sphere is going to be closer to flat. Um, and when you're talking about the interference that you would observe when you have these two speakers, you really, to do the math, 
um, to consider the intensity everywhere, you would have to consider that it is, in fact, a spherical wave. Um, but that math is hard and often and not worth it for some of the, um, for some of the things that we're going to talk about uh, phenomenologically. So if you have these two speakers, and they're emanating, they're sending, both sem sending out the same pitch, as you move along between the two speakers, there will be points where the two waves overlap and you end up getting constructive interference. So let me put big C's. Um, actually, they've put them here. You get constructive interference where the peak of the wave, both waves is in the same spot. Um, so you have, to, you know, here this is peaks of the, the peaks of the waves add up. This one here is where the troughs of the waves add up. Now, your ear perceives the uh, amplitude of the wave squared, so you're going to, you're going to hear that this as both, uh, um, you're going to hear the troughs as the same intensity as the peaks. So you would actually, if you consider the waves over all space, I can try to draw the extension of this wave, and I guess these don't really intersect much, but this one is going to intersect with that one, and this would come over here and intersect uh, the way I drew it, not quite. You would again get constructive interference here. You would have another region of, of constructive interference where the amplitude is negative over here. Um, figuring out the exact amplitude would take an equation for both of the, um, for the waves themselves in from both sources. But what you will hear if you walk along is that um, if you walk between these two speakers, or let's say you're walking out from this speaker, you're going to hear uh, a louder sound here. And then here, when you're at this inner, when you're right here, you're going to hear a louder sound than when you're in between these two waves and there's destructive interference. Uh, and then here you're going to hear a louder sound where there's constructive interference. So as you walk along, you're going to hear that it gets louder and softer. And as you, so as you walk along, it gets louder and softer and louder and softer. And hopefully your teacher has a demo so that you can actually see this. Um, all right, and often what you do to make sure that they, now that's if they are, if you, if they're um, at least, if they have to be driven by the same generator because they have to either be in phase or out of phase. If they have random phases relative to each other, you're not going to see this interference pattern. Um, so, yeah, here you can see a much more complicated picture where it shows the, uh, so the red points are where you have constructive interference because you have two crests. The green points are constructive interference because you have two troughs. And the yellow points are where you have destructive interference because you have a trough and a crest. Now, the intensity is not the same for each of these, so here, if, the, if both waves start out with the same intensity, this one you're dealing with, the, the same, this one is the same distance from each source. So this one, it's going to be really, really loud. And right here, you're going to have almost perfect cancellation um, because the amplitude of both waves is the same. But if you go over here, then you are closer to this source and further from that source. So you get constructive interference here. Um, but here you, you, you have destructive interference, but it doesn't totally cancel the wave out. Um, so, uh, so it depends on how far away you are from each of the sources as well. Here there's an example. You have two speakers separated by five meters driven by a signal generator at an unknown frequency. A student um, walks out six meters, so away from the source. Uh, and down two meters and finds the first minimum of, minimum of intensity. Okay, so what you know 
is then, let me draw right, what they call R1. And actually here, this one shows a little bit of, this shows the geometry. So R1 and R1 minus R2, let's just take an absolute, well, let's switch that because it looks like R2 is larger and it is larger. So that distance has to be half a wavelength. Um, and we know, so you haven't found, uh, this says that you find um, the first minimum. So as you're walking out there, you haven't hit, so you know that you've got to have walked at least, um, the smaller length has to be, at, let's see, the smaller length can be half a wavelength and the, uh, the first one, the other one can't be at zero wavelength. So one has to be uh, one wavelength. You can't be zero wavelengths or else nothing interesting would happen. Um, so uh, this asked what the, um, what is the frequency supplied by the generator? Since we are given these lengths, we can calculate what this distance is. So we have R1 is, let's, let's do R2 first. R2 is 3 squared plus 6 squared square root minus R1 is 2 squared plus 6 squared square root. And this has to equal the wavelength, and we therefore get that the wavelength is twice that. And two times the square root of three squared plus six squared minus the square root of two squared plus six squared is point seven seven oh, and this is all in meters so point seven seven meters and then the speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency the speed of sound is 343 meters per second so the frequency is the speed divided by the wavelength which is 343 meters per second over 0.77 meters. Which gives us a frequency of 447 hertz, or just a tiny little bit above an A on a violin. Okay, so then an application of this interference is noise canceling headphones. And of course, uh, when these first came out in the, um, in the mid 80s, no one heard of them, no one had used them. Now anybody can buy them and they're perfectly affordable and you see them all over the place whenever you fly on an airplane. So what happens in noise canceling headphones is that they actually create a sound with the uh, exact opposite uh, amplitude of whatever sound is coming in and uh, the same intensity. Uh, so in that case, they get destructive interference and you don't have to listen to the sounds around you. It doesn't work for a very, they're not capable of hand, at least the ones that you can buy over the, that you can buy for regular use don't usually cancel uh, out extremely loud sounds, but they're pretty good at canceling out 
softer and softer noise that is, we call it white noise, that tends to be um, all sorts of frequencies. Now, we can move on to standing waves and pipes. We had talked about standing waves on a string and standing waves on a, or, or on things like a bar of metal. Standing waves in a pipe are the logical extension of that. Um, so now, when we have a closed pipe, you have to have a, um, you have to have a node um, at the closed end, and, and, and you have to have a, um, you have to have an anti-node at the open end. And you can actually model a lot of musical instruments as one closed end and one open end. Um, so this, and th what you do is you blow air and you will find a resonance um, that is the fundamental frequency. Um, and that is the pitch that you hear when you excite the, um, when you excite the fundamental. It's actually possible to take the, um, if you have, say, a tuning fork that resonates at the same pitch as this pipe, you can move the tuning fork close to the pipe and you will excite the resonance in the pipe as well, or vice versa. Uh, so if you, have a, uh, if you have an instrument that is playing a sound at exactly the same pitch as your tuning fork, you will be, when, you, when the pitches match, the, the instrument's sound will actually resonate the tuning fork as well. This also happens, say, if you have a stringed instrument. Uh, if you put the tuning, if you touch the tuning fork to your uh, your instrument, it will cause the instrument to resonate at the pitch of the sound. And you can actually even see this if you do that. You will, if you this is matches the pitch of the of one of the strings, the fundamental frequency of one of the strings. It will cause that string to to vibrate as well. Um, so here. You can have, a, so you have a standing wave created in a tube by a vibration when, uh, when you have the resonance near its closed end. You just need to have something that uh, vibrates at roughly the same fre frequency as the resonance. You get your next frequency, just like when we were talking about waves on a pipe, you get your next frequency when you have squeezed in a half, an, another half wavelength. It's the next, the next frequency where you have um, a, a node on one end and an anti-node on the other. So you can take this, and so your first resonance has a quarter, the length is a quarter of a wavelength. Your second resonance, the, um, the, wave, the wavelength, is, sorry, the, the length is three quarters of, the wave, of a wavelength. Add another half wavelength, and the next frequency is, uh, let's see, this should, this is then five fifths of a wavelength. Sorry, this one is one quarter of a wavelength, this one is four thirds of a wavelength. Sorry, three fourths of a wavelength, this one is, uh, the length is five fourths of a wavelength. This one is uh, seven fourths of a wavelength. You're just squeezing in more and more uh, more waves each time, and so you can write the wavelengths. The first wavelength is four times L. The second wavelength is four L divided by three. The third wavelength is four L divided by five. The fourth wavelength is 4L divided by 7. So your nth wavelength is going to be 4L divided by 2N plus 1. And so you're not, this is actually part of the reason why woodwinds make slightly sound different. They have a different timbre from, uh, from stringed instruments because you're actually getting a different mixture of the re of resonances. Uh, you're getting a different mixture of of pitches excited when you uh, when you play a woodwind instrument that has a closed end and an open end compared to a stringed instrument. So there's a bunch of problems that you will do where you are asked to uh, find 
what these wavelengths are. Um, and you'll find many physicists, myself included, we don't memorize the equation. We'd rather we derive it. OK, a pipe that is open at both ends. You have then nodes at both ends. So the lowest wavelength that you can excite that has a node at both ends has uh, the, um, you have the length is equal to 1 half of a wavelength. And therefore, lambda is equal to 2L. The next one, you're going to squeeze in another half of a wavelength. So now the length is equal to one wavelength, or the wavelength is equal to, I'm going to write this suggestively as 2L over 2. In the next wavelength, you're going to squeeze in another half of a wavelength. So now you have that the length is equal to three halves of a wavelength, or the wavelength is equal to 2L over 3. So then you can get an equation for the wavelength in general. The nth wavelength is 2L over n. And of course, this is the same thing as what we got for uh, a wave on a string. All right. And some instruments can be modeled as a pipe, which is open on both ends. Some instruments can be modeled as a pipe which is closed on one end and open on the other. Beats are what happens when you have two sounds which are very close in pitch, but not exactly the same pitch. So if you have a violin um, which is tuned to one frequency and a cello which is almost playing a note almost at the same frequency, but not quite. Um, what you're going to see when you add up those two, uh, those two waves is they're mostly in phase. So you will see one dominant wave, wavelength, which is the frequency, whatever pitch, they, the average frequency. So, um, or the average wavelength between those two sounds. Um, and then you're going to see an envelope where the intensity varies um, and the, uh, the frequency of the, um, the frequency with which that, uh, that sound intensity varies is equal to the difference of the two, um, of the two frequencies. So what happens if you have two sounds which are almost at the same pitch is that you will, you will hear them go, you'll hear the average pitch, and then you will hear the intensity vary so that it, go, it goes So that's actually one of the ways when you're tuning instruments that you can tell how close you are to the right pitch is that you will actually be able to hear those beats yourself where the, um, where the intensity uh, dips if you're j almost at the right intensity. And then you know that you're pretty close. So if you hear, uh, if you hear beats, uh, about one beat per second, that's telling you that you're about one hertz off. So you're pretty close. Um, and then you want to minimize that so that you, you get, usually you can get it so you cannot hear the beat anymore. Of course, any two instruments are not going to be quite at exactly the same pitch, but you can get it to where the human ear can't really distinguish. You can have something called the Doppler effect. So if you have ever heard an, ambul an ambulance drive by, um, what you hear is that the, the intensity of the sound um, changes as, or, sorry, the pitch of the sound changes depending on where, whether the ambulance is approaching you or going away. Um, so I like to think about this as if, uh, the, you know, it's not strictly speaking correct, but it always gives me the right answer. Um, an analogy where I imagine that your sound source is someone who's throwing marbles at you. And um, if, if I have an older brother, so he did all sorts of crazy stuff. So I'm just going to use him as an example. 
if my brother, when we were growing up, had been uh, running at me, throwing marbles at me, when he's running towards me, the marbles are hitting me faster than he is throwing them. So if he's throwing them, throwing one marble per second, and he's running at me, they're going to hit at, they're going to hit me more than one per sec, one, more than one per second is going to hit me because, uh, because each one has less distance to travel before it actually hits me. Um, the marbles are traveling at the same speed. This is analogous to your sound wave. You can think of your sound wave as made up of a bunch of different wave front fronts. Each of those wave fronts is traveling at the speed of sound. So if you are moving towards the, the sound source or the sound source is moving towards you, those, sound, uh, those wave fronts are going to hit you faster than if you were stationary. The flip side of it is if the, if, so if now my brother is sitting on the couch throwing marbles at me and I'm running away, they're going to take longer to hit me than if I were just standing there waiting for him to hit me. Um, and now what your ear hears is frequency, is how quickly those, uh, those wave fronts are reaching your ear. So when you are running away from the source, the frequency is lower because it takes longer for each wave front to hit your ear. When you are running towards the source, or the source is running towards you, then it takes less time for each wave front to hit your, hear, your ear. You hear it as a higher pitch. Um, so here you can see, uh, a, so uh, in, in greater detail, you have a stationary source that is sending out sound waves at a constant frequency um, that at a fixed wavelength, and there's a given wave speed of sound. Um, so both, uh, so two stationary observers are going to observe the same frequency because the sound wave takes the, the, the wave fronts take the same amount of time to reach each observer. However, if you now have say the, observe, the, the source moves towards one observer and away from the other, um, they hear different pitches. So let's say my brother, this is my mom, this is my brother running towards me throwing marbles, and this is me. So my brother is running away from my mother. She sees the marbles leaving his hand, you know, she's, or let's say, He's throwing marble. Let's say he's. This is my friend. This is, this is me. He's throwing marbles at both of us. My friend gets hit slower than I do because my brother's running towards me and away from my friend. So we can dis, we can write the equation describing this frequency shift right here. This is the um, frequency of th that the observer sees. This is the frequency of the source. This is the speed of, the, of sound. And this is the speed of the observer. And this is the speed of the source. So if you have... Um, so if you have the two, um, the source and the observer approaching each other, you take the upper sign. If the source and the observer are moving away from each other, you take the lower sign. Now, I am the type of person who always gets these screwed up. So when you do one of these quantitative problems, check your answer. Um, if the source and the observer are moving away from each other, then the frequency should be lower. The frequency that the observer um, hears should be lower. If the source and the observer are moving closer to each other, the frequency should be higher. Think about my brother pelting me with marbles. OK, and this shows if you have a stationary source emitting a wave with a constant frequency and a constant, um, and a constant wavelength moving. Uh, the wave is moving at a speed of sound. The, an observer moves towards the source. It doesn't matter 
if the observer is moving towards the source or if the source is moving towards the observer. There's a symmetry in the problem there. Either way, you're going to end up with a higher frequency sound. And here you can show a picture showing what's happening to the wave fronts. So as you, um, if you have the source and the observer, um, so in, so the, if the source is moving and the, let's see, in B, the source is moving faster than the source in C. So in B, these wave fronts get crunched up um, more than in C, they are spread apart. Um, and all of these, this is, so what you hear is going to be the sum of the waves um, at wherever the point, wherever the point that you're observing is. Then we can talk about shock waves or mock cones. This is what happens when you have something moving faster than the speed of sound in the medium. Now, note that it's the speed of sound in the medium. Um, so if you change mediums, like you're looking at water instead of air, um, the speed of sound changes. So when you have a source which is moving faster than the speed of sound, you're still emanating the waves spherically, um, but the source is the source has already the the source is moving ahead of its own wave fronts, so it emits the green wave. If it so, let me go back to for comparison this picture. Um, by the time that uh, so the first wave is emitted, and then by the time that the second wave is emitted, you're still within the circle from the first wave. You haven't, the, the source has not reached the wave front for the first wave when it sends out, the, the, for the first wave front when it sends out the second. With shock waves, the source has passed its, fir, its wa first wave front when it sends out its second. When, so when you're, when the sound is at its first maximum, it sends out, you, you call that the wave front. When it gets to the second maximum, the source has already moved past the wave front for the first maximum. That is, um, that is when we get a shock wave because what happens then is that these, uh, that the wave fronts then add, um, add constructively and you end up with a region of high pressure um, that here, this, you've got a triangle, this length is the speed of sound time the, times the time that it has taken, and um, here you have the amount of distance that has uh, traveled, and here's how long it, this is the distance from where you observe the sound. Um, and so this is the amount of time that it takes the sound wave to travel from here out to the observer. So now um, you're standing here. Um, you can you define the angle of that shock, shock wave as the sine of Vt over Vst. So the speed of sound, uh, the speed of sound in the medium versus divided by the speed of of sound of the source. And we define the Mach number as the ratio between the speed of sound, or the speed of the source and the speed of the sound. Um, the faster the speed of the source, the smaller the angle. Um, and if you see an airplane pass by, um, you get two sonic booms, one from the nose and one from the tail. That, uh, that reach the ground after the plane has already passed. Now we can move on to some examples. So here you have three stationary observers and they all observe the Doppler shift from a source moving at a constant velocity. The observers are stationed below. Um, which observer will observe the highest frequency and which observer will be We'll observe the lowest frequency. So the source is moving towards observer one. So observer one is going to hear a higher frequency than observer two. 
What can you say about the frequency observed by uh, observer three? Well, the source is moving towards observer three at this point in time. So at the beginning, observer three is going to hear a higher pitched sound, um, but it's not, the source is not moving towards observer three as quickly as observer one. So at the beginning, the pitch is gonna be between what observer two hears and what observer one hears. And then the source is gonna pass. And at the point that the source passes observer three, the, then the pitch that is heard by observer three is going to be lower than that observe, from observer one. And, but it's still, the source is not moving away from observer three quite as fast as, um, as it is moving away from observer two because it's not, um, because, the, because you've got a little bit of distance here. So right afterwards, the, the highest pitch is gonna be here and then the next highest pitch is there, and then this is the lowest pitch. All right, here you see a stationary source and moving observers. Describe the frequencies observed by the observers for this configuration. So now um, you have observer one moving towards the source. Let's compare that to Observer two, which is moving towards the source faster. So this frequency is going to be high, higher than that frequency. This frequency, is, this is moving towards the source, but it's not going directly towards the source. So this frequency is going to be the lowest of the three. All right, here you have a graph showing a compression wave. There are, uh, this is the wave function at two, different, um, at two different points in time. What are, the, um, what are the wavelength, maximum displacement, velocity, and periods of the compression wave? All right, so our general equation is y of x and t equals some amplitude. This actually doesn't ask uh, it does ask for the amplitude, it asks for the mass maximum displacement, sine kx minus omega t plus phi. All right, now this is giving us, this is distance divided by distance. I want to highlight that this is in millimeters, not in meters, so you have to read the graph carefully. We want to figure out what the wavelength is. We're going to pick something that's easy to read. So from peak to peak, we go from 2 to 8. So we have a wavelength of 6, and our units on that axis are meters. Our amplitude is the maximum displacement. We can read off that the maximum displacement is 2 and that has units of millimeters. So we can also write it as two times 10 to the negative three meters. Um, and then we want to get the velocity and the period. So we need to have the speed. We're given enough information to measure the speed. So at t equals zero, and we're going to assume that the, the, so this is t equals zero, and this is t equals 0 0.005 seconds. We're going to assume that this crest has not, this crest has only passed, has not passed any of the other crests, so that we, uh, we can say that this traveled then one, two, three meters in, five times 10 to the negative three seconds, or 0 0.6 times 10 to the fourth meters per second. Okay. So that's our speed, or our velocity. Um, and then this asks for the period of the compression wave. So, Speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency, which is equal to 
the wavelength divided by the period. Therefore, the period is equal to the wavelength divided by the speed. So now I have my wavelength is six meters and my, um, this is, ah, I put, I want 10 to the negative, 10 to the third. I hadn't yet written this as six times 10 to the fourth. This is six times 10 to the fourth meters per second. So I get that the period is equal to 10 to the negative fourth seconds. Now, just a little note about checking your answers in an intro physics class. Oftentimes, the answers are chosen to be neat, um, both so that you can do the answers in principle without a calculator, even if hardly anybody still does, except for, uh, except for me. Um, and also, because then you can use that as a way. If your answers are looking really ugly, the odds are reasonably high you've done, you've made a mistake. So I have to do an interlude here. When I was in high school, I got the Student of the Month Award in my trigonometry class, and the instructor got up and said, well, why did this, why was I getting the award? Every year she had a student who did, who tried to do everything without a calculator, and that was me. And we're in the middle of the award ceremony, and my mom leans over and says, so you lost your calculator again? I actually hadn't, but it was these expensive calculators, and I always lost it, so I figured that I had better know how to do it without a calculator because the odds were I was going to lose my calculator again. All right, during a 4th of July ce celebration, a firework explodes on the, the ground, producing a bright flash and a loud bang. You have a certain, the temperature is 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Two observers see, or the, see the flash and hear the bang. Um, and one observer sees the difference as 0.1 seconds, and the other sees it sees the difference as 0.15 seconds. Um, and you are told, um, so this is asking, what is the distance between the two observers? All right, so then the first thing that we, so what we know is that however long this distance is, um, it took the first observer, so this says the first observer, so delta x1 is what we get when we take the, so we have the speed equals the distance over the time, or the distance is equal to the speed times time. So this in, is going to be the speed of sound times time one. And this is, so time one is 0.1 seconds. Time two is 0.15 seconds. And the speed is equal to, or is that the delta x is equal to the speed of sound times time two. All right, and then you are told that the two observers, if you draw a line from the firework to each observer, they, that makes a right triangle. So what is the distance between the two of them? So this is going, the total distance is going to be delta x1 squared plus delta x2 squared and the square root of all of that. And I can write this as the speed of sound times, and here I'm going to use this and that. Let me put a little subscript 2 right there. Um, so this is going to be equal to the speed of sound. I'm pulling the speed of sound out of the square root times t1 squared plus t2 squared square root. All right, so now I need the speed of sound. Um, and 
you are given an equation for the speed of sound at a given temperature is equal to 331 meters per second times the square root of 1 plus the temperature in degrees Celsius divided by 273 Kelvin and 95 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 35 degrees Celsius. Plug that in and this gives you a speed of 352 meters per second. And then here we have the distance. I'm going to switch markers here. The distance is equal to 352 meters per second times 0.1 seconds squared plus 0.15 seconds squared. is, a, let's see, which is equal to 64 meters. A few different ways you could do that last little algebra. So this is another example where there's there's you you have the tools, but unlike what you might have seen in intro classes in, in lower level classes in say high school or what you might see in um, in other subjects. We're not giving you a type of problem and you just have to solve it algorithmically. You're going to have to read this problem and figure out what it's telling you. Um, and I should also mention one of the most common mistakes that students make when they're working out these problems is the simple mistake of plugging the numbers in wrong. Now, when I am grading a, an exam, for instance, if you've got all of the, the work correct and you just plug the numbers in wrong, I'm going to give you most of the credit. If you have, uh, so that's a an, an reason to work on how you lay out your argument. You're not just answering the problem. You're not just trying to get the right answer. You're trying to tell me what the right answer is and prove to me that you know how to get it. All right, here you have sound created by resonating a tube shown, shown here. The air temperature is 30 degrees. What are the wavelength? wave speed and frequency of the sound produced. All right, we have to use that same equation we had before for figuring out the temperature, or sorry, figuring out the speed of sound, 331 meters per second. Um, I love the fact that this uses Celsius instead of Fahrenheit. Ah, you physicists like Celsius. So this is 30 degrees over to Celsius divided by two and or 30 Kelvin, because it's a change in temp temperature, over 273 Kelvin. And here, so 331 meters per second times the square root of 1 plus 30 over 273 is... 349 meters per second. At, that's the speed of sound at 30 degrees Celsius. That's a nice hot day. Um, what is the wavelength? Okay, so here I have a length of 60 centimeters. And in that 60 centimeters, I can fit one, two wavelengths. I can also view it as how many cycles. One, two. 
so I can read off that my wavelength is 30 centimeters, which is equal to 0.3 meters. What is the, so I've got the wavelength, the wave speed. What is the frequency? Here I'm going to use that the speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. So the frequency is equal to the speed divided by the wavelength. So this is 349 meters per second divided by 0.3 meters. is 1,162, 1,162 um, hertz, because one over se a second is equal to a hertz. All right, this is a fun one. A tube filled with water has a valve at the bottom to allow water to flow out of the tube. As the water is emptied from the tube, the length of the air column changes. Um, a tuning fork with a frequency of, of 1,024 hertz um, is placed at the opening, and water is removed until you reach the fifth mode of resonances. And what is the length of the air column if the temperature of the air in the room is 28 degrees Celsius? All right, we are gonna need that speed of sound, 331, meters per second times 1 plus 28 over 273 is 348. Notice that at 35 degrees Celsius, it was 349 meters per second. Now it's 348, or if you want to be precise, 347.56. It's a very slow change, so the speed of sound doesn't change that rapidly with temperature. All right, now we know that for a pipe with one open end and one closed end, the wavelength is equal to... 2L over 2N plus 1. So the first, let's see, hang on. It was, the first one is, hang on, let me rederive this. The first one is 4L because you fit a quarter of, uh, so the first one you fit a quarter of a wavelength. Uh, we'll just rederive this before. I think I made a mistake. So the first one, um, you have the length equals one quarter of a wavelength. So the wavelength equals 4L. The second one, you fit an extra half wavelength. So L is equal to, a wave lambda is equal to 4L over 3. So here, my wavelength of the nth order is 4L over 2N plus 1. Yes, my previous equation was wrong. Here's case in point. A physicist will rederive everything to avoid having to memorize an equation. All right, so now lambda 5 is equal to 4L over 11. And how long is that? So what length is that? Um, and here, lambda, so V equals lambda F, or lambda equals V over F. So this is equal to the speed of sound over the frequency. And I am asked to solve for the length. So the length is equal to 11 fourths times the speed of sound over the frequency of the pitch fork. 
That is 11 fourths times 348 meters per second divided by 1024 inverse seconds. And this is... 0 0.933 meters. That's a pretty big height for that tube, but that'll do it. Okay. So here we have, consider the following figure, the length of the string between the string vibrator and the pulley. Uh, you're given the length of the string vibrator and the strength of the pulley. I didn't write it down. We'll say that that is one meter. And then the linear density of the string is six grams per meter. The string vibrator can oscillate at any frequency. The hanging mass is two kilograms. What are the wavelength and frequency of the mode? Okay, so here, the speed is equal to the tension divided by the um, linear density, the square root of the tension divided by the linear density on the string. So this is equal to mg divided by that linear density. And um, then you know the speed is the speed of sound we will use the speed of sound at zero degrees Celsius. This is equal to the wavelength. Uh, uh, sorry, actually the speed of, it is not the speed of sound, bear with me. Uh, the hanging mass is two kilograms. Ah, this is your, your given for the lowest mode, sorry. Now the lowest mode, this is equal to the wavelength times the frequency uh, the lowest mode has the wavelength equaling uh, 2L, and this asks for the wavelength and the frequency. So the wavelength is 2 meters. The frequency is the speed divided by the wavelength, which is equal to 1 over 2 meters times... 2 kilograms times 9, so let's do 2 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared divided by 6 grams per meter, so meters, so 6 times 10 to the negative 3 kilograms per meter and one over two meters times the square root of two times 9.8 times zero, or sorry, divided by 0 0.006 is equal to 28.6. Now let's watch our units here. Um, I have the kilograms cancel out and I end up with meters squared per second squared in the square root. So I end up with meters per second divided by meters. So I end up with units of Hertz, 28.6 Hertz. What is the string oscillates the, uh, around the string? What is the wavelength of sound if the speed of sound is 343 meters per second? Okay, so the wavelength, the, in this case now, the speed is the speed of sound, and the frequency stays the same. I like this problem because this, uh, this shows you how to transition from uh, 
mechanical wave to a, to a sound wave. So the wavelength times the frequency, the frequency, the frequency stays the same. And then we have the wavelength is equal to the speed of sound divided by the frequency or 343 meters per second divided by 28.6 inverse seconds. is 12 meters. All right, that's a nice round number. That makes me have confidence that I plugged my numbers in right. By the way, if you want a tip for how to make sure that you're plugging your numbers in right, one thing that you can do is use a graphing calculator, and your graphing calculator lets you store numbers as variables. It is easier to plug variables in and check your work. Um, and make sure you didn't make any mistakes typing stuff than it is to plug in the actual numbers the entire way. I say that and I'm using the phone on my calculator, which is not nearly so sophisticated. All right, and our final example, two speakers are producing the same frequency of sound uh, and they are a distance D apart. You draw an arc along a circle um, and at the midpoint of, so at the, midpoint of that angle, at what angles will, will there be maxima and at what angles will there be minima? So there's going to be maxima whenever the distance is, so here we're going to use the, um, we're going to use a small angle approximation and you can calculate, you can estimate, this is actually a cool one, you're going to see this later on in your studies. If you have two speakers and you're doing, you're looking at, you have two sources and you're looking at waves that are a long distance away from the source. Now you know that these two waves, uh, that the, the two rays of directly from the source are not really parallel, but if, they're, if the, the observer is really far away, you can approximate them as parallel. And so then you can uh, draw a line like this and draw a line and try to then draw the line at the midpoint and the if these are roughly parallel and you're far away this angle is the same as is roughly the same as that angle we will call it theta and if these are two parallel lines that's the same thing as this angle, theta, when this is a right triangle. And then this path length difference by the traveled by the two waves is d sine theta. So this is the case when you've got your source far away from uh, your, your source is far away from wh whatever receiver you're looking at. When that path length distance is equal to um, some integer number of half wavelengths, um, let's see, when will there be maxima and when will there be minima? Um, there are maxima when this is equal to a wavelength, um, some, some integer times a wavelength, and there will be minima when you have some integer number of wavelengths plus a half. So whenever the two waves have traveled either the same number of wavelengths or some integer number of, the difference is some integer number of wavelengths versus when, this is when you get maxima because they add up constructively because they're the maxima, the peaks of the waves are together. When the difference is a half a wavelength, you have a peak in one place and a trough in the other, and then you get destructive minimum, uh, destructive interference, and that's when you have your minimum. That's going to come up later on. That's a really useful approximation. Note that if you considered the full proper radial distance, you would not be able to, to do that. You'd have to do uglier math. 
And remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. And with that, we're going to end this chapter, and we'll move on to the next volume after this. Thank you.